maybe i mean you mentioned at the the beginning that some of the confusion can arise because of a lack of understanding of biology so perhaps we go sort of very basic to begin <laughs> with and talk about menstruation and and what's happening and then but the the sort of 101 of how birth control works. Yeah. So this kind of gets back, though, to what we were talking about earlier about religion and natural, right? So what are the words that you describe religion or God with? Pure, clean, and natural. And those are sort of the words that people ascribe to not being on contraception, right? So this idea that you're in this natural state, which is a godly state, and we do see a lot of overlap with the disinformation with kind of the radical right here in the U.S. I think it's really important for people, especially in a country where we are here, where access to contraception is at risk. Access to, you know, basic, um, you know, reproductive health care is at risk for a large percentage of the country. So birth control can work in a variety of different ways. So if we're talking about um, uh, the birth control pill, then the primary method is by suppressing the LH surge. So each month you have an egg that starts to develop and then uh, under the influence of the hormone follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. And then when it reaches a certain point and the estradiol levels are right and all of the chemical soup is correct, you have a surge of luteinizing hormone or LH which triggers ovulation. Now, thinking about it, a lot. what a lot of people don't know is there's always sort of waves of follicles that are coming up, getting ready to develop. And so it's super important for the body to have an ability to shut down ovulation because you don't want to keep ovulating once you're pregnant, right? So you have to think about all of this in terms of pregnancy because that's how it evolved because that would be not good and you don't want to get a second pregnancy on top of another, like how would that work? So when you start releasing the hormone progesterone, from the corpus luteum and then later from the placenta if you get pregnant that's basically a break on lh it shuts it down and so that stops ovulation but it doesn't stop the follicles kind of coming up and then oh nothing's there to stimulate me oh coming up nothing there to stimulate me so when somebody's on the birth control pill the primary method is suppression of lh from the progestin that's in the pill, which is a progesterone-like hormone. And the estrogen does some suppression as well, the estradiol. It also helps to suppress the FSH. And so what happens is your follicles are kind of on ice around day three. So they're producing low levels of estrogen. Um, there's a confusion. Some naturopaths think people are like in a menopausal-like state on the pill, and that's not the case. And the secondary effects for contraception are also the progestin has a really profound impact on cervical mucus and makes it kind of inhospitable to sperm, which kind of sounds like the sperm's coming over for tea and the you know, cervical mucus is like, sorry, you can't come in. And possibly an effect on tubal motility as well. So there are, you know, there are these other things, but cervical mucus and suppression of the LH surge are the two key mechanisms. And what's happening to egg production when you're on the pill? keeps coming up and going. So it still going. occurs. Yeah. And okay. they just doesn't go anywhere because otherwise if we put people on the pill, it would delay menopause, right? So, cause you only have a certain number of follicles, you know, about 400,000 or so. And so it's really a group effort. It's about a thousand follicles to get one ready to ovulate. And along that sort of long pathway, you lose a lot. And so, yeah, so you keep, you keep developing an egg and then it doesn't go anywhere. Right. And do we have any studies that have looked at how um, use of birth control, oral birth control, affects fertility? I have, there's no impact. So no method of contraception has any permanent impact on fertility at all. Depo-Provera, which is an injection, can have a delay in return to fertility. It's just, that has a very profound effect on LH. And also because it's an injection, it can take a little while for people to metabolize it and clear it through the system. But they put people on birth control pills to help time IVF cycles. So, you know, if it affected fertility, they wouldn't be doing that, right? So they do it because the great thing about it is it holds those follicles in kind of day three. So you can basically time things very nicely. In terms of taking oral contraception, is the, is the protocol to take it for for three weeks and then you come off for a week or do you just take it continuously? I've seen different ideas out there. Well, it sort of depends on an individual's goal. And I think this is one of the big problems with 
a lot of things in medicine is people are totally just given something and they aren't given all the explanations that go along with it. So initially there was the 21 days on, seven days off because people didn't like not having a period when they were on the pill. The original pill was every day when they were testing it in the 1950s. And people thought they were pregnant. And, you know, this is a time when abortion was illegal and, you know, people were concerned about it. So they decided to have this seven-day gap. But now we know it's not necessary. And in fact, what can happen is because those eggs are coming up and ooh, going away, coming up and going away, that seven-day gap can sometimes one pill, one egg can be like, oh, hey, I'm going to run with it. And then all of a sudden you can have an escape ovulation, right? So that seven-day gap has a slightly higher pregnancy rate. And why have a period if you don't want to have one? Right. So when you stop taking birth control, how quickly does the body kind of bounce back and get back into its natural rhythm? Next cycle. Because you have to remember, your whole system is set to be able to be shut down by pregnancy and then come back online, right? So the idea that, because the whole suppression of LH is exactly what happens during pregnancy as well. So what would you say to someone, let's say they're in their mid-30s, they've they've been on the birth control pill for 15 years, they've come off and they're having trouble falling pregnant. So they should have an investigation to find out why that is. So one of the big reasons people start the pill is they were having cycle problems, right? So often people go on in their late teens because for a lot of people, there can be a lot of cycle irregularity in the first few years like a lot. And they can have very heavy periods and very irregular, they have bad acne. And people want to go on the pill because they, they don't be bleeding all over the place. So they don't want to, you know, maybe they have bad cramps. When you stop the pill, you go back to what your baseline was going to be. So there's no change that happens because of it. That's really been, you know, I think very well studied. It So the common reason we see is people go on the pill because they were having these problems. And probably what was happening is they were polycystic ovarian syndrome in evolution, right? So what's one of the most evidence-based treatments for polycystic ovarian syndrome? The estrogen-containing birth control pill. So they were well-treated with for those symptoms for 15 years because they were getting high-quality evidence-based medicine. Then they stop it, and now that original problem is back again. But people mistake it for a side effect of the pill. Yeah, or I've seen people suggest that they simply masked the issue and, and they they wish they had have treated the PCOS. Well, but the estrogen-containing birth control pill is the, the number one evidence-based treatment for many of the symptoms. So I'm not sure what other treatment they would have wanted. They could have, they could have tried metformin perhaps if that was appropriate for them, but it's not like there was a secret diet or a secret supplement that would have fixed it. Um, and so, and we can make the diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome when people are on the pill. We can talk to them and ask people, what were your symptoms like beforehand? If someone tells me that they had a problem with facial hair before they got on the pill, they had really irregular cycles before they got on the pill, you probably have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So, you know, I think that again, it comes down to sort of someone spending the time and explaining what's happening. And so, uh, and of course, there's a lot of um, just unfortunately misinformation from medical providers about, you know, PCOS as well. Is infertility rates increasing? I'm probably not the person to ask about that because I don't, you know, I don't have an infertility-based practice. I, I'm not aware of data that says that, but I'm going to give you a caveat there that you probably should be talking to a, you know, a board-certified reproductive right. endocrinologist for that. The other question that I get here is what about blood clots? And I think earlier you mentioned the importance of understanding risk. Yeah. So people, people like to talk about the risks of the pills, and there are risks. And people say, oh, there's a black box warning for the pill, right? And if pregnancy were a pill, there would be a black box warning right? So the risk of blood clots baseline is like, you know, one to five per 10,000. And with the pill, it's like three to seven per 10,000. So sure, there are a few extra that are going to happen, but it's not 20 times, it's not 10 times. And, you know, in the postpartum period, it's 20 to 50 per 10,000, right? So, you know, so you're putting all that in perspective. And you have to say, what is that doing for you, right, as a person? So if it's allowing you to not have 15 years of, of you know, 
say you were going to have three pregnancies in those 15 years, then absolutely, you know, you've had a net benefit from that. If it's allowed you to treat your painful periods, you've had a net benefit. And, you know, studies actually tell us that, you know, taking the pill is not associated with a decrease in longevity. There's a decrease in ovarian cancer, a decrease in endometrial cancer, a decrease in colon cancer, a slight increase in breast cancer while you're on it, which goes away when you stop it. And also there's a slight increased risk of breast cancer in pregnancy. So people always have to Put it in perspective. Right. Does all of this or some of this also apply to intrauterine devices and um, contraceptive implants as well? So yes and no. So the contraceptive implant, uh, the edonogestral implant, also works by suppressing the LH surge. And, but it just has progestin. There's no estrogen in it. And there's also a pill that there are also several pills with just progestins in them as well. Why would someone opt for or be prescribed that versus the other option you mean an estrogen containing pill versus one without so up until recently the there was only one progestin only pill certainly on the market in the states anyway and there was some concern that it might not be quite as effective adding the estrogen in probably added a slight increase in efficacy also reduced the problems of irregular bleeding so made it easier to be on but there are some newer progestins that are longer acting that um, that seem to have the same efficacy rate as the estrogen containing pills. So they're very new. They've been on the market for just a little bit of time. So really the main reason to be on the estrogen is really if you're having cycle control issues or if you're somebody who has polycystic ovarian syndrome, you absolutely want that estrogen. That's an important to counteract the testosterone. Um, and people with premenstrual mood dysphoria, that seems to also be an important component. Those are the pills that have been studied. So those are the kind of the big differences between those pills. The edonogestral implant just has progestin and it suppresses LH and has a profound effect also on cervical mucus. And it's even more effective than the pill. Highly, highly reliable. And I have to say, when it came out, I thought, oh, people aren't going to like that. And they love it. I'm constantly amazed at how many people like the implant. Um, but yeah, I'm coming from, there was an older implant when I trained called Norplant, which was six rods in the arm and had all kinds of bleeding problems. And so, you know, you sort of come to that thinking, oh, is it just the same? But it's not. And people love it. So there's the edonogestral implant. There's two different kinds of, two different classes of IUDs. There's the copper IUD. Uh, and there are progestin IUDs. And the copper IUD is basically copper is toxic to sperm. So that's how that works. And the progestin IUDs work by the effect on cervical mucus. Mm -hmm. And the safety profile of those? They're great. So, um, you know, the there's obviously a risk of having some pain with insertion, and that's a whole separate discussion, but there are many things that can be done in the office for that. Many times pain is undertreated, and that's not acceptable. The um, There's a very small risk of infection with insertion, like one in a thousand risk. Uh, there is, um, with a copper IUD, some people can get some heavier periods afterwards, which nobody is ever pleased about, but there are also things you can do for that. Taking actually ibuprofen can reduce the heavy periods. Uh, and the progestin IUDs, um, will can be associated with some irregular bleeding but over time that tends to go away and for many people they'll have no periods at all with the progestin iud's there's also some you know lower risk of side effects some people will report acne um, and ovarian cysts as well so those are kind of the major ones do you find uh, clinically oral contraception is helpful for managing symptoms during the perimenopausal phase? Yeah, absolutely. So when people are in the menopause transition, that's characterized by erratic ovulation. And the only way to shut down erratic ovulation is to shut down ovulation, right? So for some people who are bleeding all over the place, who are having you know issues with worsening premenstrual mood dysphoria during the menopause transition, who are really suffering from hot flashes, the birth control pill with estrogen can be super useful. Uh, some people don't want to be on that, and they can. another option would be to have the hormonal IUD to control their periods and then try a low dose, a, a typical menopausal dose of estrogen, which is you know significantly lower that's in the pill. And it just kind of depends on what are the problems you're trying to fix, right? So what's bothering the person? 